good morning, everybody. Good to see y'all. Thank you for being here today. And uh, it is uh, it's a nice day out there, although it's supposed to get cold uh, starting tonight. Although my wife and I have been going back and forth about this heater, like turning the heat on or keeping the heat off. I'm going to win in this argument. I'm just telling you. And I'll update you next week and let you know how that goes. But that, that's my goal this week is to win. Uh, the battle for the thermostat, but anyway, if I don't show up next week, you'll know what happened. And um, anyway, thank you all for choosing to be here today to worship with us. Those of you who are watching online on Facebook or maybe later uh, on YouTube as well. Let me say, if you are a guest here with us today, thank you for choosing to worship with us. I'm going to ask you to do us a favor. Uh, you, there's nothing in the pew in front of you right now. We've uh, The hymnals and all that stuff are, are not out because of COVID. However, if you are a guest, I'd really like to, to know that and get a record of your visits. I'm going to ask you if you will send, send an email. Uh, my email here at the church is john, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org, J-O-H-N at mycbcc.org. So just send an email, uh, let me know who you are, and, uh, and I can respond, and we can uh, have a conversation that way. But thank you for choosing to worship with us today. I uh, hope Sunday school went well. We started Sunday school back this morning, walked around a little bit, and uh, folks are back in, the, in rooms. We moved a few people around, so thank you all for patience. Uh, and that, I know that is uh, always a, a little bit difficult thing to do, to change Sunday school rooms. And so thank you for those who were uh, willing to, to do those things. And thank you for our teachers for being patient. It's only been about seven months since we've had Sunday school. That's it. So you've had plenty of time. You've had seven months for today's lesson, and now you've got a week for next week's. And so, uh, but I know how, how that can feel uh, at times. But guys, thank you for those of you who serve in that way. Well, guys, I'm going to pray for us, and then uh, we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We thank you for everything that's going to take place uh, in this room today. We thank you for uh, Sunday school. We thank you for all that you have done. And Lord, I pray that you would just fill us with your spirit this hour. Lord, that we might be empowered to worship you in spirit and in truth, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, will you stand with me as we worship together this morning? As we sing, worthy of the worship.
guys, you can go ahead and be seated. Normally, this is uh, Adam's time to come and do the scripture reading uh, when he tends to preach a little mini sermon. I give him a lot of grief about that. And uh, but uh, he and uh, Rebecca are on vacation this week. They're probably driving back uh, probably today. And uh, they're spending time with family in Florida. But it worked out well uh, because uh, I don't know if y'all know, but there's an election this week. Are y'all have y'all are y'all up on this? Did y'all know this was happening? Just caught me off guard. I didn't know. You know. <laughs> I want to read something to you. First Timothy chapter 2. We came a few Wednesday nights ago. We actually uh, looked at these verses. Paul writes, First of all, then, I urge you that entreaties and prayers, petitions, and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, as a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Paul gives us the command to pray for those who are in authority. He mentions specifically, he says, kings and those who are in authority. And he does it in the context of the gospel. He does it in the context of pray for these people so that we will live a a quiet and tranquil life so that ultimately God will be glorified and that difference will be made because God wants to see people come to faith in him. And so you and I have been commanded to pray for our leaders. And we come to a time this week in our nation uh, that, I don't know about y'all, but as you watch the news and as you think about it, uh, it, it could get ugly. I mean, it really could. We've already had, you know, the words have been ugly for several years now. Uh, the campaign has been ugly. We've had violence. We've, there's always a, a tender box in some areas that could go off at any time. And so we just don't really know what this week's going to bring for our nation. Uh, we know that Tuesday people are going to go vote. Many of us have already voted. Uh, you've told me we've done that as well. We voted early. We don't know exactly when we'll know the results of the election because different states are doing things differently because of the virus. So will it take a week? Will it take two or three days? Will it go on for a month? What's it, we just don't know what's going to be happening in our nation. But here's what we do know. We do know that ultimately whatever happens, The Lord is in charge of those things, that that he allows those things to happen. But here's what I want to do now for the scripture reading time, and and I want to pray specifically for this week. I want to pray for those who are running for office, both our president and both former Vice President Biden. They are always in danger. Their families are always in danger. Uh, We've seen all kind of crazy plots over the last few months to kidnap political leaders and just things that don't even make sense that you wouldn't, you know, three or four years ago you would have never even fathomed and yet these things are, are, are happening in our nation. So I want to pray for their protection. Pray for God's will to be done. Uh, pray for behavior to be, you know, God honoring and glorifying and ultimately for peace and, and the fact that, that we can show the world that, yeah, we disagree about things. Yes, we have people on both sides who, who on, the, on the far extremes act like they shouldn't. And yet, we as a nation can come together and do things the right way. So Paul says we're to pray for our leaders, and so let's do that now. Father, we, this week in the life of our country, we come to one of the most important things that we do. Father, we do pray for peace and safety for the candidates. Lord, we pray that you would protect the president and those around him. Lord, we, we pray for everyone involved in that process. Lord, we pray for former Vice President Biden and all those around him that you would keep them safe as well. Lord, there are other elections going on and other things we're voting on. We pray for every candidate and uh, on both sides, Lord, if, or whatever side they're on, that you would just keep them safe. And those who are, are plotting harm, those who are causing trouble, Lord, that you would just help the authorities to find those things and, and to shut those down. Lord, we pray for a peaceful election this week. Lord, I pray as believers that, that we would vote in a way that honors you, and, and, do, and but also live out our faith in the midst of all this um, uncertainty in a way that brings glory and honor to you in, in the things we say and the things that we share on social media. Whatever it is, Father, I pray that we would be salt and light during this week in particular. 
So, Lord, we pray for your will to be done in our nation. Lord, we know you are in absolute control of all things, and whatever happens, you have allowed it. And, Lord, I pray that you would just use this ultimately for your glory, for your name's sake. And, Father, that you would use us as your children to, to point the way, to point to the fact that you are in charge and that hope is always absolutely true, that, that, that there's hope in Christ no matter, no matter who is in the White House, Lord, that you are in control. So, Father, bring us comfort with that truth and use us to help others to see it. So, Lord, watch over our nation this week. Keep us safe. Keep everyone safe. We pray, Lord, that, that all the, the votes would be counted in, in a way that we would know exactly uh, how this election is, uh, how it works out, Father, then we could move on and uh, just give everyone wisdom to know what you would have them to do. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together again as we sing about the greatness of our God.
Let's pray together at this time. Father God, you are great. And Father, there is no one like you. It's good to remind ourselves of that as we come to worship you today. For we forget so often how great and mighty you are. Father, I thank you that you're our creator. You're the sustainer of all. And we need you. And we're here to confess that today. We need your guidance in our lives and our families, our churches, and our, our country. Uh, we look to you for everything that we need. Father, I pray in this time ahead that, Father, we would uh, just recognize and know that we need the work of your Holy Spirit through the power of your word. And we just pray that you would empower Brother John as he preaches your word today. And that you would move in our hearts in a powerful way that we would respond in faith and obedience. Uh, I pray most of all, Father. I pray we keep our focus on the gospel and on your kingdom above all. May the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in us all. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, before the choir sings, it's time to dismiss children for Children's Church. So we're going to head to the back of the sanctuary. We'll meet you there. And then from there, we will go to the children's area. So you are dismissed at this time. Thank you, choir. They, uh, that was good, man. Yeah, I like that. It, uh, I don't know if it was planned this way. There's something about the music, Bill, that made me remember uh, what yesterday was. Y'all know what yesterday was? You're going to say Halloween, aren't you? But that's not the answer. No, it was uh, the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation uh, on October the 31st. I can't remember the year. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, that's when uh, Martin Luther uh, nailed the 95 uh, Thesis to the walls there of the church. And 
it is it got people back to the Bible. It got people back to the scriptures and it got people back to the original languages and trying to figure out and the realization that we're saved by grace through faith and, and all of that. And so I would I don't want to go blaring past yesterday with just out remi without reminding us that we are very you know we are the the benefits of that and some 500 years past it uh that return to uh to scripture and uh speaking and uh, all that started because of the song i just want to say uh the choir did a great job uh last sunday afternoon if you're able to be here for that or to watch online uh as well they put a lot of work into that easter concert and we're going to do the same thing uh, for the Christmas concert uh, in December. I can't remember the exact date. I've got it written down somewhere, but we'll do that same thing. We'll have it in the afternoon uh, after church, and you know, we'll go eat lunch and come back and do it that way. And so uh, they start, they've already started. Like they did the Easter concert, and then Wednesday night, they started on Christmas music, and so uh, they're, uh, they're excited about that. Well, guys, uh, I thought we would continue with the theme of what uh, I talked about during the scripture reading and for us to talk a little bit about our relationship to the government because the bible actually tells us quite a bit uh, about that and because it's on all of our mind uh, with the election coming up this week and it's something that's going to dominate the news i thought we would just talk a little bit about that so i want to ask a question this morning it's a very simple one what is our relationship to the government I'm talking about believers. I'm talking about people who have repented of our sins and placed our faith in Jesus Christ. What's our relationship to the governing authorities? Now, I'm going to give you the answer up front, and then we'll work through it. And it's simply this. We submit for the sake of the gospel. Now, notice the last part of that phrase. I'm looking at that screen. Y'all see this one. For the sake of the gospel. Here's what we have to keep in mind, that our relationship to everything in this world, everything we do, from how we handle our finances, to how we are at work, to how we deal with our families, to how we deal with church, everything should have an eternal perspective. And when it doesn't have an eternal perspective, then we, we lose what's actually happened to us, that we've been made new, that we've been given eternal life, that we recognize that all these things of this earth are temporary. You realize, and, and I hope you do if you, as you think through it, that there will come a day when our nation will no longer exist. This is a temporary thing. Because ultimately Christ will return. He will set his government up here on earth and then we'll go into forever. The new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. And we won't be, this nation won't exist anymore. This is a temporary thing. I think it's the best thing that ever happened on the face of the planet. Don't get me wrong. But there will be a time when it ceases to exist. So we are to, to, to have our relationship with this temporary government from an eternal perspective. Because we have eternal life. So I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13. 1 Peter is one of the, the great books of the Bible. I'm, but we'll eventually go through it uh, as a church. It, it's just, I've been through it several times. It's just so good. And Peter's writing to a group of people who are under persecution, some people who are suffering. Uh, the letter's directed to people in, in modern-day Turkey. And uh, he just covers a lot of stuff. And we're in a section in verses 13 through 17 where he's telling them, here's how I want you to live your life so that lost people will see the difference the gospel has made. And he talks about relationship to government. He talks about servants. He talks about husbands and wives. He does all these things. In fact, I'm going to read some verses to you. I, I didn't, have, didn't have Bill put them on the, on the slide, but if you've, oh, if you've got your Bible to open, just look at verses 11 and 12 uh, of 1 Peter 2. Here's what, what he says, because this is the, these, three, these two verses are the, the, the guide, the context of the rest of chapter 2. He says, Behold, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. 
Now, that's another sermon in itself to explain this, so you'll just have to take my word for it and go check me on this. But when he's talking about glorifying God on the day of visitation, he's talking about Gentiles, non-Christians, within the, the context of 1 Peter, coming to faith in Christ and because they recognize the truth of the gospel because of how the believers are living out their faith. And the first thing he addresses, the first thing he talks about to the to people he's writing to is their relationship to the government. So let's read it together. 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 13 through 17. Here's what he says. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. And then he throws a bunch of commands at us. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So what I want to do today as we walk through these verses is just ask three questions. Three very, very simple questions. And the first one is simply this. Who? Who? He's about to tell us the very people, the very parts of this world that you and I are to be associated with and how we are to relate to them. So go back to verse 13. He gives a command. He says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. The command there for you and I as believers is to be under the authority of the government, to be under the authority of the governing authorities there. He says he gives that command to submit. He's going to use the same command throughout the paragraph. He's going to give this command to servants. He's going to give this command to wives. You and I are to submit to, and he says, before he tells us that we're to submit to every human institution, notice what he throws in there, for the Lord's sake. So we're doing this to bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus. We are the best citizens. We should be the best citizens in this country, not just because we're patriots, which I hope we are. That's an important thing. But we are not the best citizens just because of that. We should be the best citizens in this nation because we follow Christ and because we glorify him in doing that in our relationship with government. So he says, we do all of this for the Lord's sake. And who do we submit to, right? That's our question, who? He says, to every human institution or, or human creation. And then he gets specific. Whether to a king as the one in authority. That word, for, uh, that word there for authority, he uses in another, Paul uses in a paragraph, very similar paragraph about government. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul wrote, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So God ultimately is the one who allows governments to, to be built up and then to go away. He's the one who, who allows certain people to be in certain positions. He is in charge of all those things. Isn't it? God did not just create the world and then back up and say, okay, y'all run with it. It's not how that works. He is in charge of everything. That's why we pray. That's why we assume he hears us and, and things will happen when we talk to him, that, that he is, is actively involved in the day-to-day -day things, not only of our lives, but of his entire creation. Verse 14, he continues to talk about those in government. He says, or to governors as sent by him, so from the king. For the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Ultimately, that's what, what the government is supposed to do. It's supposed to, to be there to set up the laws and the regulations that you and I are to obey. I mean, you think about it. You know, you've got national, state, and local. We're to, to obey the, the president and the Congress and those things that are passed by the Supreme Court. We're to obey our governor and those who are at the state level. We're to obey our, you know, our mayors and, and local governments. All of those things. You and I have been called as believers to be in submission to those. I'll give you a simple example. Stop signs. Stop signs. What if we left here today and everybody in Shelby County decided not to submit to the authority of stop signs? 
Now, I don't know what time it is right now. I don't want to look at my clock because you'll then just start saying, well, how much longer is he going to preach? But, you know, I imagine if we all decided to ignore stop signs, I, could, I think I could make it home. Because I don't, I don't go through a stop sign on the way home until I get to my street in my neighborhood. But that's about as, about as far as I could get, I think. Because after that, by the middle of the afternoon, we'd all been in a wreck. Everybody. People would have been killed and maimed and hurt because we just decided to roll through these things and to power through these things. Right? That's what government is for. It's there to set up those things. It's there to, to, to say you know, legally what's right and what's wrong. And ultimately those things come from who God is because God is the ultimate authority and the definition of what is right and wrong. But that's who you and I are to submit to. Every human institution. Second question. Because I know you're, I can see y'all thinking. You're thinking, now hold on. Aren't there examples in the Bible where they don't do that? Yeah, we're going to talk about them in just a second. I'm glad you asked. Here's the next question. We talked about who. Now let's ask why. Why? Look at verse 15. For such is the will of God. Now let me just pause right there. This is one of those few times in the Bible where the Bible just comes right out and says, this is God's will. Like, you don't even have to pray about it. God has said it. This is his will for our lives to submit ourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. It's God's will. But there are times in the Bible where people don't. You ever read the book of Daniel? What about, what about the slaves in Egypt? They were enslaved, but they were under the authority of the Egyptian government, and they rebelled. What's going on with that? Is the Bible inconsistent? No. You and I are to submit to government and to be the best citizens we can possibly be until it crosses the line and we're beginning to be asked to do things that are contrary to our faith in Christ. Amen. That's why the book of Daniel is so powerful, because Daniel disobeyed government in a godly way. He always did it in a godly way and in a Christ-like way. But he, he said several, both as a young man, as a very young teenager, and as a man in his 80s. He was the most, one of the most consistent people in all the Bible. He just, there are times when he said, you know what? You can't stop me from praying. I'm going to pray. You know what? I can't eat that stuff. It, it, it's, it's contrary to my relationship with the Lord. And he didn't eat it. And his friends did that same thing. Whenever the, this submission to government only goes so far, once they begin to call on us and to try to make us and force us to do things that are ungodly, that's the time that you and I stand up and, as, as they say in the book of Acts, we obey God rather than men. But for the most part, for the most part, you and I are simply called to be under submission to those governing authorities. So go back to verse 15. For such is the will of God, that by doing right... So by obeying the laws, in other words, by, by honoring those who are over us, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. The early Christians had a reputation uh, within, within the context of, of this time. They were accused of all kinds of things. Uh, for instance, they called one another brother and sister. You know, we even do that, you know, brother John, sister who, we don't do it, say sister a lot, but we do call one another brother a lot. They were accused of incest, you know. They were accused of being cannibals because of, of the, 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 uh, the Lord's Supper, you know, that sort of... So people would just make stuff up, right? And they would take a half-truth and run with it. And so what, what, what Peter is telling them here is you need to make sure that all this crazy stuff that people are saying about you, that you live in a way under submission to the governing authorities, that you show that Christ has made a difference in your life. And they're going to see that. They're going to see it. Verse 16... He begins to tell them why and how they can do it. He says, act as free men. Now, what does it mean to be free as a Christian? It means we've been freed from sin. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Came across a commentator. Commenter? It's a commentary. So would the writer be a commenter or a commentator? I don't know. We'll call him a scholar. How's that? I'll punt. Here's a quote. I usually don't, don't read quotes from guys like this, but I thought this one was good. Here's what he wrote. True liberty 
according to the New Testament, means that there is freedom to do what is right. In other words, we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit to obey God. Hence, only those who are slaves of God are genuinely free. Freed from the power of sin and bond slaves to him. Verse 16, he says, Act as free men. Do not use your freedom as a covering from evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. And when people see it, when people see the fact that, yes, we are following what government says, yes, we are honoring the king, yes, we are, we are obeying the laws, it shows that we, what we say is that we believe is true because it's made a difference in our lives. Think about something as simple as building codes. What if we were, had to rebuild this building? Something tragic happened. And we just decided we're going to build it however we want to. We're not going to pay attention to building codes. We're just going to do whatever. You know, we're going to throw a roof up, put up some two-by-fours, just do our thing. How would that look? Well, first of all, some of us probably end up in jail or at least fined quite a bit. And we would make our testimony to all those around us would be one of rebellion and, and one of hard-heartedness and one of, one of, of, of really un, of godlessness because we've been called to obey those things. So you know what? We have a building that's up to code. I mean, I, some of you were around when the building was built. I've been told this story, and I, I think I've got this right, that, that one of the things that almost kept this building from opening up was right out here by our sign. Where am I? Here-ish. The sign that, that the shrubbery was supposed to be taller than the lights inside the... But and when we first were about to open, it wasn't. And we had to go out there and raise everything up, raise up the shrubbery so it was a little bit taller than the lights within the bed. That was according to code. We did that. I think I'm getting that right. That's a simple little thing. But what if we had rebelled? What if we'd have pitched a fit about that? What if, what if, 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 then what's the reputation of the church? How does that honor Christ? It doesn't. So you and I are called to honor him. We're called to, to submit to government. And we do it because ultimately it is God's will for us to do that. And it brings glory and honor to his name. That's the who. The governing authorities, that's the why, it's God's will. Third question, how? How? Well, he gives us several commands in verse 17, and they just come like hammer strokes. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So he says, first of all, honor all people. You know what all people literally means? All people. Because you have never met anyone in your life who was not created in the image of God. Ever. Everybody who's ever come into this world, whether Democrat, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, doesn't matter, all created in the image of God. And we're to honor all people. That means treating people with respect. It means recognizing that there's worth in God's sight, recognizing this is someone that Jesus died for. See, you've never met anybody who wasn't created in God's image, and you've never met anybody that Jesus didn't pay the penalty for their sin. He says, honor all people. Love the brotherhood. We're, and that means sisterhood too, by the way. I mean, we're we to love one another first. And if the world sees us loving one another <clears throat> and then loving the world, it's going to... Excuse me, going to show them that the difference the gospel makes. And then he says, fear God. You and I are to live under the, the assumption and the realization that God has commanded us and told us in verse 13 to be in submission to government. And if we truly fear God and respect God and honor him, we will do that. And we will be the absolute best citizens in this world up to that line when we're asked to do something that dishonors him. But guys, we really, we, I, I don't understand this. Y'all don't have to help me. And, and I'm not talking about us. I'm just talking about Christianity in general. For some reason, North American Christians, we act like we actually want to be persecuted. Like we make stuff up. Like the war on Christmas. Like, ha, like people get offended when folks say happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. I mean, that's a, that's a secular business. Why in the world would we expect a secular and lost company to act Christian? The world is lost. The, the world, that should never surprise us. But people are all, all turned inside out about that. It doesn't matter. That's not persecution. It might be annoying. It's not persecution. 
I did see a, a friend of mine put something on social media yesterday. He made a joke about Halloween. He said, for Halloween, I'm telling everybody happy holidays so I don't offend them. And I thought, oh, that's pretty funny. But guys, there are people who are being killed for their faith. There are people who are being lined up and murdered for as close as Mexico a few years ago and probably to continue, I mean, just across the border. And you and I get to get up, drink our coffee, and have our breakfast. And we stop at the stop signs, you know, and we get to come into church and worship together and sing songs out loud. We don't have to hide when we sing and, and can preach the word without reservation and, and call sin, sin and right, right and wrong, wrong. We have all we have religious freedom. And yes, there are people who are opposed to the message of the gospel. But let's not get ahead of ourselves and start finding persecution where it's not, because when it comes and it will come, you just need to read Revelation. Then we need to be ready for the real stuff. But all this little piddling stuff that we think is persecution now, we just do we just need not worry about it. Because that's not what it is. It says, honor all that was a soapbox, I'm off of it now. Verse 17. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and then he brings in that last command. Honor the king. Honor the king. Honor those who are in authority. One of the things that always surprises me, you know, every time a sports team wins some national championship or whatever it is, you know, they go to the White House. And there's always one. There's almost always one that holds out. They're like, well, I don't like this president, so I'm not going. Y'all, if the president invites you to the White House, go to the White House. Because there's honor in that office. There's honor in that position. Whether you voted for the person or not, I'd kill to go to the White House and go in the Oval Office. I'd, you know, I'd shake the guy's hand and I want to look around. You know, I want to see the stuff. I'm always reading a presidential biography. It's something I've always got on the shelf. I want to go in the room, you know. I want to see the place. Probably never happened, but, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'll come. So I guess the first thing is I have to take up a sport and win a national championship. <laughs> Maybe a little late. I don't know. We'll try. Honor the king. Whether you voted for him or not, that's the command. Honor those who are over us. So let's think about that for right now. Because, guys, frankly, I worry about us. Not just us, not just y'all and me, but Christians in general right now in North America. Here's why. I fear. I fear that, that this election, and really the past 12 years, has been so mean-spirited. And the edges have been so hostile. And, and, and everybody has been a fear monger. I worry that we have allowed that stuff to seep into our life to the point that we behave like we don't actually trust God anymore. And that worries me for all of us. It worries me for our spiritual health. It, it worries me for, for how we relate to one another. It, it worries me for, for what the, the future of the, of the nation looks like. You know, if the rhetoric can, just continues to escalate... What's it going to be like when my girls are grown? I mean, it's, it's, and so I worry about that for us because it's real easy to always be angry. It's real easy to, to see the other side as pure evil. And yet these are people, whatever side you're on, whether you're right or left, often the, the, the other side is characterized as being, being inhuman and evil, and they're not. Now, they may hold to some evil practices. I think it's very clear uh, abortion is an evil practice. I mean, you see, that, you see child sacrifice in the Bible that, that, that is condemned constantly. But people who are created in God's image who, who are pro-abortion have been, have been sold a lie and they've bought into it. They're spiritually blind. But there's still people created in God's image. There's still people that Jesus died for. And we're to see them from an eternal perspective. Now, that's hard, isn't it? That's hard, but it's reality. We're to love them and honor them, even when we disagree with them. And guys, I do worry about our spiritual health. For, for those in this room, for those who are watching, for myself, for, for just for the whole country. Because all of that hate and anger starts creeping in into every part of life. Because you start seeing anybody who disagrees with you as inhuman and completely evil. 
And things just get worse and worse and worse. And yet we're told. He didn't qualify it. He didn't say honor the king if you voted for the king. He just said honor the king. It's not an easy thing to do, but remember who he's writing to. He's writing to people who have repented of their sins and placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord, who the Holy Spirit of God lives in. And he empowers us to do these things. This is The presidential election is the thing we're all worried about. Both sides are worried about it. Right's worried about it. The left's worried about it. Everybody's worried about it. Most of you probably voted early. We've already voted. We're all going to watch the, the returns. I think we've already printed out our, our uh, Donna always prints out electoral college maps, you know, so the girls can color all that stuff in. You know, it's just, but you think, well, what's the nation going to be like? But think about it. I, I, y'all, y'all know how long we've had a president? 231 years. Washington was inaugurated in 1789. My girls have a song that Donna can teach you if you want to learn one of the homeschool songs. I can hear it in my head right now. I'm not going to sing it. Y'all don't want me to do it. Amen. Thank you. I got an amen to that. 231 years we've had a president. We've had a lot of bad presidents. We've had a lot of good presidents. We're still here. You still got to go to the voting booth. You still have the freedom to worship. You and I still are able to live in a nation that I think is the greatest that's ever been on this planet. 231 years. We've had a lot of good ones. We've had a lot of bad ones. And whoever wins this week is just going to be another one in the line. And the country's going to be okay. It is. We'll adjust. You know what? If it gets gets harder for us as believers to do what we're going to do, you know what we're going to do? We're going to keep on going. We're just going to keep on going. That's it. We're going to gather. We're going to worship. We're going to tithe. We're going to, we're, going to, we're going to share the gospel. We're going to do all those things. Because ultimately, that's our calling, is to follow Christ first. See, our ultimate citizenship is not in the United States. It's not in Tennessee. It's not in Shelby County or North Mississippi or wherever you live. Our ultimate citizenship is in heaven, Amen. where we will spend eternity. And while we're here, we're to be the absolute best citizens we can be. We're to submit to government up to that line. When they start asking us to do ungodly stuff, we we obey God rather than men. But until that time comes, you and I are to honor those that God has placed in authority. And in times like this, that is not an easy task anymore. And so here's what I want to challenge you on as a believer. As a believer... Have you let the fear and the hate and the anger get your eye off of Jesus? Are you so worried about the outcome of this election that you just think if this person gets elected or this person doesn't get elected, it's over? Because that's out there. God hadn't gone anywhere. He's eternal. He is everywhere. He is in absolute control. And all you and I can do is go to the booth and punch the ticket and then go home and watch the results. That's all we can do. And know that it's in his hands and that he's in control. So let me give you a little bit of advice. Only watch about 10 minutes of the news each day. Figure out what the highlights are and then turn the thing off. Turn it off. Because everyone, you know, you know why, you know what they want to do? Every news organization wants to keep you scared and angry so that you continue to watch so you can see the commercials. That's how they make money. I mean, that's it. It's a business. Let's not fool ourselves. So find out what's going on. Turn it off and go read a book. Go, go have your quiet time. Go for a walk. Do those things. And get away from the anger and from the hate and all that stuff that is absolutely eating us apart right now. So if you have allowed that stuff to infiltrate you today, just just confess it to the Lord. And just ask him to give you strength and wisdom to see it. And and to view what's going to happen this week from eternal perspective, that no matter what happens, God is in control. And ask him to give you a sense of peace. And maybe one of the problems is that this has all gotten a hold of you to the point where it's all you can think about. 
and you're so worried and you're so scared and, and all those things and, and you're sharing hateful stuff on Facebook and Twitter and, you know, it's just awful. Well, it might be that the reason you're struggling with all that stuff is you're not what, Paul, what Peter talks about here. You're not free. You haven't been made new in Christ. You don't have the spiritual ability to live the way that Peter's talking about. Because you haven't repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. Today you can do that. You can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And he will make you new. You will not be the same person you were. And you can begin to view life with eternal life. And view things from God's perspective. That might be the problem. With the fear and the anger and all of that. That you haven't been made new in Christ. But guys, I worry about us. I worry about our spiritual health. I don't worry about the future of the country. The Lord's going to take care of that. We've been around for a long time. We've had good presidents. We've had bad presidents. But God's called me here to be y'all's pastor. And I'm worried about you. I'm worried about your spiritual health. I'm worried about your anger. I'm worried about your fear. And I'm worried about, about all the things that, that is out there that can get us out of walking with the Lord and truly trusting him. Get rid of all that stuff today. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, show me the areas where I have let the world infiltrate when it comes to all these things that are happening. And there's freedom in that, and there's hope in that, and there's a recognition that ultimately Christ will return. His kingdom will be set up forever, and we'll go into eternity face to face with him. That's what we hold on to. That's what matters. That's what's eternal. So before we move into our, our time of, um, of invitation, we need to, to shut the, the screen down. Bill, you might need to go do that. I don't know. Jodon's going to do it? Okay. Jodon's going to shut the screen down. For those of you who are watching, as Jodon makes his way to it, if you need to talk about what it ne means to be saved, what it means to be a Christian, send me an email. John, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org. J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org. And we can talk about that. Or if you just need somebody to pray with you, just do that. Joe and I is going to shut this down right now.